right, so uh, if you were here at part one or you watched the video, some of this initial uh, discussion is going to be a little bit repetitive, but I thought it was important to make sure everybody in the room was on the same page uh, with respect to sea level rise. So when we're talking coastal adaptation to climate change, uh, at the end of the day, I'll mention a few things, and the guidebook mentions a few other things the coastal communities worry about. Uh, but sea level rise tends to be both what uh, communities are encountering first and what triggers the most legal uh, nexus, shall we say. So uh, that's where I, I wanted to focus again today. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its last report, AR6, uh, is expecting about half a meter of sea level rise globally on average by 2100. Uh, now, there's some flex in that even within the IPCC report. Uh, it, for those of you who know, the IPCC tends to be a little conservative. Uh, and there is always uncertainty about sea level rise, uh, particularly when it comes to melting glaciers uh, and melting Antarctica, which are not behaving like scientists expect them to behave, uh, generally to the increase in sea level rise over time. So all this with a lot of uncertainties, and it is a global average. So, but like I said, Half a meter expected, maybe up to a meter uh, in some, uh, some scenarios. But again, with the uncertainties that uh, if Antarctica and Greenland in particular don't behave as expected, which so far they're not behaving as expected, it could be higher. All right, next. All right, and that projection is a global average. So as you're all aware, what's happening on your local land base geologically and in terms of subsidence <coughs> is also important to the sea level rise experience locally. Uh, and California, uh, had, according to NASA, has different things going on at different parts of the coast. So uh, on this map, the redder the coast is, the more it's rising, which means the impact of sea level rise will be mitigated to some extent. Uh, the parts in blue are sinking, and so sea level rise will be exacerbated to a certain extent in those places. Uh, worst place to be in the United States for subsidence is Louisiana uh, and Mississippi. Uh, the, their sea level rise potential is the, the highest in the country. Uh, but along the west coast, we get these mix of areas uh, rising and sinking. And next. All right, so like I said, global sea level rise on average has been rising about 0 0.1 inches or 3.3 millimeters per year for the last three decades. That is accelerating. Uh, the causes are, are right now about equal between thermal expansion as the ocean warms water expands as it warms, uh, and additional water being added from those melting glaciers. Uh, at some point, there will probably be a tipping point where the melting glaciers are the dominant force. But for right now, it's about even. When I started doing sea level rise, it was the expanding waters that were the, the dominant force. So we are seeing a shift in that balance. Uh, and like I said, the, the elevation of your land is also relevant to what local communities will actually experience from sea level rise. Next. All right, and uh, to give some uh, sense of that uncertainty, uh, Climate Central did some projections for LA County. Parts of LA County are rising, parts are sinking. Uh, and so best case scenario by 2030, and I realize change time frames, but uh, for LA County, you see there's just a little inundation, those light blue spots, uh, particularly around the port areas and the beach areas. Next slide. But if the assumptions go the other way and it's actually worse than expected, you can see that inundation gets much farther inland much faster. And all of that is exacerbated by storm surge. Uh, we had a nice little hurricane you know, a month ago, so we're getting some weirder weather than normal. Uh, 
when I was in Florida, we talked about hurricanes and what combination high tides, storm surge from the hurricane, and rising seas could do. Uh, we may be having to worry about that a little bit more here as well. But that, that's the killer combination is you get a hurricane at high tide in a place that's already being inundated. All right, so uh, worst case scenarios could be farther inland. Okay, next. And then just to go to that 2100 frame, like so this is Climate Central's worst case scenario for LA County by 2100, and you can see that light blue goes much, much farther. All right, next. So uh, you are probably all familiar with this, but again, just to make sure we're all on common ground. Uh, three basic approaches to adaptation. You can try the protect strategy. Uh, which generally, historically, has involved uh, hard gray infrastructure, seawalls, revetments, uh, coastal armoring of various sorts. Uh, that tends to fail eventually uh, and tends to make the slow adaptation of the coastline harder. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there, that has been the classic strategy. Uh, Karina eventually will be talking about some green strategies as well, some experiments going on with those. But there are ways to use the natural coastal ecosystems like dunes and wetlands uh, to actually protect the coast through restoration and uh, some uh, help to them, restoration of them, uh, to protect the coastline as well. And those tend to allow for uh, greater adaptation possibilities as time goes on. Second major strategy is to accommodate. Uh, if you are reading in the, the wake of hurricanes this season in the Gulf, uh, putting buildings on stilts is being required uh, in many counties where it wasn't being required before, but that's one strategy. Basically changing your building code so that any construction along the coast has to be able to accommodate a certain amount of sea level rise. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the sunny day flooding in Miami? Nobody? Okay, sunny day flooding in Miami. Uh, Miami is experiencing sea level rise to the extent where high tides are enough to flood the lower parts of Miami, including coming up through the drain pipes into parking garages. They've discovered some major octopi in parking garages on high tide days. Uh, so that's the kind of situation where you start thinking about do we have to adjust our building codes uh, to accommodate what's going on. Uh, classic one uh, after uh, some severe storms was, you know, backup generators for hospitals probably should not be in the basement if your basement's going to be flooding out on a regular basis, all right? So that's the kind of, uh, kind of accommodation approach. And like I said, it's usually being done through building codes right now uh, is one way of getting that in there. Uh, and we do have some elevated uh, shoreline structures in the south coast here in California. All right, and then the big one is retreat. Uh, in some places, like I said, uh, New Orleans being classic, Louisiana being classic, there is going to be no choice but to leave what is currently coast and will someday be underwater. Uh, and so retreat uh, can be planned for, it can be as a result of a disaster. Uh, planned for is usually better for a lot of different reasons than just as a result of a disaster. Uh, it also depends on having some place to retreat to, and that's what some communities throughout the United States are running into, even if they want to do retreat, uh, it's not easy, it's just kind of flipping a block back because it's solid development all the way back. And so in those situations, retreat turns into moving a whole community uh, that is already going on in Mississippi and Louisiana and for some native villages in Alaska, it gets much more complicated at that point to try and relocate a whole community. But, uh, City of Ventura does have a retreat plan, and I will I'll show that in a couple of seconds. So, three basic strategies. They're not mutually exclusive, by the way. That's important to emphasize. It's, it's three buckets you can put them in, but you can be doing elements of all of them at the same time. Next. All right, and this is an illustration of that, a more complicated view of things. Um, 
You can't just let the C come. Uh, there are some reasons why that's going to not be a good idea in the long run because a lot of the infrastructure on the coast ends up being toxic. Uh, as Hurricane Katrina taught us very, very well in New Orleans. Uh, so not planning to dismantle certain things along the coast uh, will ultimately not be good. Seawater sea is good at dissolving a lot of different things. Uh, we talked about just the protect strategy. Uh, so you build a major seawall. Uh, eventually what happens is the beach erodes away and all you've got is the ocean crashing against the seawall. Uh, eventually the ocean will win. All right. <laughs> so uh, it's one thing about the ocean. It may take a while, but it's persistent and it's strong and eventually it will win. Uh, and then anything behind that seawall is in a world of hurt. Um, Accommodate, you see the house on stilts. Uh, this is very, very common along the Gulf Coast now. Uh, if you haven't been there, uh, they do a lot of houses on stilts. Perversely, there are a lot of communities that are still filling in toward the sea, seashore. Uh, that is not a great adaptation strategy, but it is nevertheless occurring. Our coastal communities are still growing for the most part in the United States. Um, so advance not generally the best adaptation strategy. We talked about retreat, but the bottom one, uh, retreat plus putting in some of those green adaptation measures, uh, restoring coastal dunes with vegetation, restoring coastal wetlands uh, to help buffer the retreat process. All right, those can protect the infrastructure. Next. All right, uh, again, there's a range of ways to combine the, uh, if you're going to do armory, uh, the green and the gray structures, um, much vegetation, uh, wetlands, if you're in the right climate, uh, coral reefs are very good at buffering sea level rise, uh, so putting those in place, but you can combine them with various levels of gray infrastructure as well, so you do get the spectrum of how to combine those armoring techniques, protective techniques. Next. <clears throat> All right, uh, Karina's going to talk about this much more later, but uh, one popular way of protecting uh, the coast through a green infrastructure is through uh, sand dunes, particularly vegetated sand dunes. The vegetation helps keep the sand in place, uh, and that provides some naturally adaptable but very protective uh, mechanisms for aiding in adaptation strategies. So uh, as we all know, beach renourishment straight out tends not to work for very long. I think the record was two months before all the sand was gone again. Uh, but putting that vegetation on and creating an actual dune ecosystem uh, can help uh, tremendously. Next. Okay, so gray, uh, like I said, it's, it's very, very much in common use. There are maps of how much gray infrastructure there is along the coast of the United States, and it's quite a bit of the coast already has gray infrastructure in place, uh, but eventually it does nothing to help the progressive inland movement of the sand, and eventually the sand just gets wiped out, and it's just the seawall protecting the uh, coastal infrastructure. Next. So just some examples, uh, this is very obvious farmering in Malibu, uh, in California. Next. And then uh, I said I was going to show you Ventura's plan, uh, Ventura County's plan. Uh, very busy graphic, I acknowledge that, but the yellow triangles are uh, important parts of any plan to retreat which are physical things happening in the world, physical triggers that say, hey, it's time to move to the next <coughs> step of the plan. Uh, so, <clears throat> the first one, which I'm sure none of you can read, storm waters overtop the beaches, all right? We got to the point where when we get the big storms, the waves are coming over whatever's out there on the beach and starting to get into the streets. Huh? That's a trigger. That's when we need to start moving to the next phase of planning for the retreat. Uh, the yellow triangle next, the flood insurance claims from storm waves hit a certain level, all right? Flood insurance 
It's going to be a big indicator for a lot of communities that it's time to start getting serious, uh, particularly when the flood insurance goes away, which it already has in several Gulf states. So sort of like fire insurance in California has been having some issues because insurance companies can't make money. Uh, the federal flood insurance program is already seriously in the red and local flood insurance will eventually go away. A lot of communities are using that as a trigger point when those flood insurance uh, claims get to be too big. And then uh, the last trigger up there is the, the beach width reduces to a certain amount. Uh, they've got summer and uh, winter measures. And uh, when it gets to that, it's time to start the serious phase of retreat plan. Uh, that's the way you, that's the way you do retreat planning correctly, is to think about what those triggers should be. Uh, as with most things that are going to be probably controversial when you start actually implementing them, deciding on the triggers while everyone is calm, cool, and collected is usually better in the long run than deciding as the waves are crashing over the first roll of houses. So uh, planning ahead is a good idea for any retreat strategy. All right, so that's it on the introductory part. Uh, we have time for questions and then an activity. I think I kept this all time. Perfect. All right, the next little bit, I'm gonna talk about the two major agencies involved in coastal adaptation. Uh, acutely, we're starting with the Coastal California Coastal Commission that we have representatives in here and that many of you have dealt with the California Coastal Commission on a regular basis. So I'm gonna do what lawyers do best and talk, tell you about some case law that has uh, come down recently uh, that, that affects what's going on with the California Coastal Commission and uh, coastal adaptation. So next slide. So again, just to review uh, the three basic approaches, protect, accommodate, and retreat, uh, the California Coastal Commission would uh, be involved in any of these three. Next. All right, so uh, next. So the California Coastal Commission was created in the 1976 Coastal Act, uh, which provided for a comprehensive scheme to govern land use, uh, planning in California's coastal zone. Next. Uh, so the commission is also the state coastal zone management and planning agency pursuant to the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act is jointly implemented by NOAA <coughs> and the EPA. Uh, it has money available to states that cooperate uh, and submit coastal adaptation plans, uh, which also now include coastal non-point source water pollution management plans. Uh, and as a result, all coastal states except Alaska do uh, participate in the Coastal Zone Management Program. Uh, one of the other perks that was given to states that have approved coastal zone management plans, as California does, uh, was that uh, any federal agency activity that could affect the state coastal zone uh, would then be subject to state consistency determination. So the state gets to opine on whether uh, whatever the federal government is doing is consistent with the state's coastal zone management plan and absent a national security reason or a couple of other exceptions, uh, the federal government generally should try to be consistent with that coastal zone management plan. Uh, some grand historic battles between the state of California and the federal government over offshore oil development and the Coastal Zone Management Act uh, which, by the way, helped to shape uh, the Coastal Zone Management Plans and the Coastal Zone Management Act consistency determination over time. So, uh, California's been instrumental in the implementation of that act, which is why I wanted to emphasize it. Next. All right, so uh, what is the definition of the Coastal Zone in California? Uh, next. It's the land and the water of the uh, area of the state of California from the Oregon border to the border of the Republic of Mexico, the entire coast, in other words, uh, as specified in maps adopted by the state legislature. 
uh, extending seaward to the uh, state's outer limit of jurisdiction, which I'll get to when I talk about the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, including all of the offshore islands and extending inland, generally a thousand yards. So default is a thousand yards inland, uh, but it can be bigger. Uh, so if there are significant estuarine habitat and recreation areas, uh, the coastal zone extends farther inland. Uh, next. Conversely, if it's a major urban area, the coastal zone tends to be a little bit narrower. Next. And then finally, uh, the coastal zone does not include uh, the area of jurisdiction of the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, because uh, they're already managing. Next. All right, so what does that look like? Uh, the red should be extending offshore as well, but you can see there are some narrower parts of the coastal zone and some wider parts of the coastal zone as those different areas of the coast are encountered. But everything in red, like I said, and going out to sea is the coastal zone. Next. All right, so the commission has jurisdiction over quite a few activities uh, in the coast, most importantly for coastal adaptation. Next, uh, any permit adaptation, or any permit action, so coastal development permits. Uh, next, it also oversees categorical or other exclusions from coastal development permit requirements. Next. As already mentioned, it's the lead agency in California for that federal uh, consistency review. Next. It has oversight of lo local coastal programs uh, and any government entity with beachfront property within its borders must adopt a local coastal program. Many of you probably have them or have encountered those. Uh, and uh, adoptions and changes of those programs are subject to the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, which I'll talk, be talking about this afternoon. Finally, it's, uh, uh, the commission has oversight over most coastal development plans, uh, including port master plans. Next. All right, so those coastal development permits are where uh, adaptation and the Coastal Commission tend to come together most often. Uh, and next, so any person wishing to uh, perform or undertake any development in the coastal zone must obtain a coastal development permit. This will come usually from local governments first. But the definition next of development is pretty broad. Uh, and includes the placement or erection of any structure on land, in water or underwater, the disposal of dredged material or waste, the grading, removing, dredging, mining, or extraction of any materials, the change in density or intensity or abuse of the land, or changes to coastal access. So it's a broad definition to begin with, and the California courts interpret it broadly on top of that. So it, it, tends to be bigger than rather than narrower. Uh, all of which, in doing any of that, you're going to be talking about a coastal development permit. Next. So, shoreline armoring is specific, specifically mentioned in the act. Uh, next. Next, there we go. Uh, so, section 30205. Uh, revetments, breakwaters, groins, harbor channels, seawalls, cliff retaining walls, and other construction that alters the natural shoreline processes shall be permitted when required to conserve coastal dependent uses or to protect existing structures, and the existing is important legally, uh, or public beaches in danger of erosion, and when designed to eliminate or mitigate adverse impacts on shoreline sand supply. So some limited uh, recognition that some shoreline armoring uh, is necessary and uh, may be uh, needed as a matter of not taking coastal property to protect existing structures. Huh? So uh, Karina and I call this discussion seawalls are complicated. This is part of why seawalls are complicated, right? Some of them are allowed, some of them are, are even mandated. Uh, but there's a general uh, drive not to have many more. So, next. 
Uh, that leads to the guidance on coastal adaptation planning uh, that the commission put out and then uh, updated in March of 2018. And the general thrust of this guidance, and it is guidance, uh, not law, is that local governments should be thinking about building into their coastal development permits uh, the, the future of the coast. What's the coast going to look like in the future? And how can those permits uh, aid adaptation in the long run? What kind of conditions can be put in to aid adaptation in the long run? Now, it's a long guidance document that is a very concise summary of what's in there. But uh, in terms of what's been going on in, ter in case law, that has been uh, where the challenges have come in some pretty big recent cases. So next. All right, so 2017, the California Supreme Court decided Lynch versus California Coastal Commission. Uh, next. So Barbara Lynch and Thomas Frick owned adjacent coastal properties on bluffs uh, uh, in Encinitas, uh, which is, comes up in these cases quite a bit. Uh, they were protected by a joint seawall that was uh, put in in 1986, retroactively permitted in 1989. Uh, next, had a bad winter storm that sort of wiped out <laughs> that seawall and part of the bluff and they needed to rebuild. Uh, so, uh, next, the California Coastal Commission approved uh, their proposed coastal development permit uh, with a bunch of conditions, uh, some of which were looking toward adaptation on the seacoast. Uh, three of them really ended up in legal con contention, and those were the three that the Supreme Court ruled on. Uh, so next. First one was uh, there was no private access stairway on the bluff, so none of these. All right, second. Uh, the permit had a 20-year time limit. And uh, any future building on the bluff top could not rely on the seawall for its structural integrity. So any development that had to occur had to occur uh, with structural in integrity, not dependent on that coastal infrastructure. Okay, next. Um, and then finally, before the permit expired 20 years in the future, uh, Lynch and Frick had to apply for a new permit, either to remove the seawall, to change the seawall, or to just continue with the structure. But it, it, it had to be revisited in some form 20 years down the line. Okay. Next. So, um, this is what lawyers refer to as a lawyer mistake, or getting a client at a bad part of the, the legal proceeding. Which was, they kind of said, okay, and went ahead and built the new seawall. And then decided to challenge the conditions. And next, uh, the California Supreme Court said, you know, if you want to change the conditions in your permit, challenge them, you better not build the seawall in reliance on them first. Because you just waived your right to challenge. So... Continuing importance of this case, uh, those conditions were in there. Everybody now knows if you want to challenge the adaptation conditions, you do it before you build the structure that just got permitted. So, like I said, probably won't see that one again, but at least it's now established a Supreme Court law that if you're going to challenge the conditions, do it first. Next. All right, the second two more interesting, although they're both from the Fourth District Court of Appeal. Uh, so Lindstrom versus California Coastal Commission in September of 2019. Uh, next. Next, yeah. So the Lindstroms uh, wanted to build on a vacant oceanfront lot, so it should be in Sunita, sorry, on a bluff. Uh, again, permit issued, but with a bunch of conditions, four of which ended up in litigation. Uh, next, so first of all, the setback had to be farther from the edge of the bluff. Uh, the norm was 40 feet. Uh, Coastal Commission said no, it needs to be 60 to 62 feet to accommodate any erosion that might occur. Next, uh, the Lind Lindstrom's affirmatively waived their right to construct any coastal structure like a seawall. So it's part of getting the development permit, they just said, 
had to agree from the get-go, no seawalls. Next. Uh, the Lindstroms also agreed that they would remove their home entirely, so be thinking retreat, uh, if natural hazards got it to the point where it could not be safely occupied. So we built in a retreat condition into the permit. Next. And then there was a condition for remediation or removal if the bluff eroded to within 10 feet of the structure. So that's 50 foot erosion, right? Because we got that 62 foot setback. So a lot of erosion. All right, so now I got into litigation. I uh, went to the, the Fourth District Court of Appeal uh, next. And it upheld all of the conditions except the third one which it said was basically okay, but too broad. Uh, so uh, court first can, uh, decided that all of these conditions were consistent with the local coastal program. But uh, the third one was overbroad <coughs> because it didn't have enough guidance to when the house had to be removed, basically. Uh, it didn't say, you know, it would be condemnable under normal condemnation law for unfit habitation but needed some standards in there about when the government could come in and order the removal of the house. But otherwise, yeah, this is fine. Build in those conditions to accommodate adaptation from the get-go. Next. All right, probably the most famous one uh, next is uh, 11 Lagunita LLC versus California Coastal Limit. Uh, Commission, again, Fourth, Fourth District Court of Appeal. Uh, this is the infamous Katzes and their <coughs> remodel, depending on how you want to classify it. That was the issue, whether it was a remodel or a rebuild. All right, next. Uh, so the Katzes had a 2015 coastal development permit that allowed for a seawall, which you can kind of sort of see was not a major structure in 2015, sort of wooden, it wasn't very thick, it was fairly easily to re removable as the seawalls go. Uh, but also said, the permit also said the permit would expire uh, and the seawall would have to come out if they redeveloped the property in a, man uh, a manner that constituted new development under the act. And that was the legal issue. Uh, because they did what they said was more or less remodeling the kitchen. <laughs> and everybody else said, that looks kind of like a rebuild to us. <laughs> so, uh, part of which involved putting a much more permanent and much thicker seawall as part of the structure. Uh, so that was the legal issue that went up. Is this new development, because re it's really a rebuild, or is this like remodeling the kitchen and hence it's still an existing structure and that permit condition didn't get triggered? Uh, these are just two of the photos from the case. Uh, it's, it's one of the few court opinions I've seen that's loaded with photographs documenting what the Katzes did with their property. Uh, next, and it came to a head because the Katzes went ahead and re redeveloped uh, and the Coastal Commission issued a cease and desist order, said remove the seawall and oh by the way we're finding you a million dollars. So it was worth litigating, uh, even under California coastal prices, all right? Uh, next. Uh, so the uh, court stress, as I emphasized from the beginning, the word development under the Coastal Act is expansive. Uh, and said, so next, Coastal Commission was exactly right. This is new development. Uh, this is redevelopment. Uphold, upheld the cease and desist order, upheld the fine. So, um, like I said, this, this was major litigation. I first learned about it when I was in Utah. I was making Utah headlines of all things. So, uh, but again, another victory for the Coastal Commission. You string these three cases together, and what you're getting is a picture coming out uh, that the courts are generally going to uphold conditions going into new coastal development permits that sort of pre-think the adaptation question, pre-think the coastal erosion, sea level rise question. Uh, and so I expect, and folks from the commission, if you want to chime in, feel free, that that will become more and more common as we go forward.
That's, that's, there we go. So that's what I've got on the California Coastal Commission. But like I said, that, that line of cases uh, is pretty much signaling that we have a mechanism to help adaptation. Um, I wanted to spend some time with the Army Corps of Engineers because its jurisdiction may be changing uh, in, with respect to some things, but not with respect to others. So this is the other major federal agency that gets involved in everybody's coast, uh, not just California's, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. All right, next. So why do we even worry about the federal government when we're talking about the coastal zone? Um, that is a feature of uh, next, the Submerged Lands Act of 1953. So the Submerged Lands Act of 1953 is the congressional response to one of the many, 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 many Supreme Court cases named California versus United States. Uh, and in this, California versus United States, uh, 1947, uh, the Supreme, it was a battle between California and the United States federal government as who was entitled to the royalties for <coughs> offshore oil drilling. 1947, right after World War II, boom, and offshore oil drilling. Uh, California, one of the states, uh, along with Mississippi, Texas, and Louisiana, fighting with the uh, U.S. government over who, who's entitled to that money. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court says pretty definitively the ocean is federal. Uh, it belongs to the federal government. The federal government's entitled to the royalties. Six years later, uh, Congress said, yeah, we're not so sure about that. <laughs> so uh, that gave us the Submerged Lands Act in 1953. It's a companion statute to the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, which is the federal statute that governs oil drilling and now offshore wind in federal waters. Uh, the Submerged Lands Act is the state side of it. And what the uh, Congress did is say, well, OK, Supreme Court said, we own it. We're giving back the first three miles of the ocean to the coastal states. Uh, so if we own it, it's yours. Uh, next. And it defines that uh, for offshore to be three geographic miles. So when I said the state coastal zone goes into the water, it goes out three geographic miles because of the submerged lands. Next. I uh, said, hey, you can manage, administer, lease, develop all those submerged lands and the natural resources. It's basically under state control. And it said, and by the way, states, if you have a history that makes you think you should be entitled to more of the ocean, you can go ahead and litigate it. Uh, lots of states tried, based on their weird convoluted histories of how they came into the United States. The only two that were successful were Florida and Texas, uh, which each got three marine leagues. Nobody knows what a marine league is anymore. Uh, but each got three marine leagues of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which is basically three nautical miles or about 10.2, or sorry, nine nautical miles or 10.2 regular miles. So uh, there's these chunks of the Gulf of Mexico that are under control of Florida and Texas, but that was the only one, the only two that won. All right, so California, like most coastal states, has got its three miles. But next, in the it's not quite as good as it sounds provision of the Submerged Lands Act. Congress said, hey, but there's some things we're keeping for ourselves. There's some stuff we want to keep control over. And most of them make a fair amount of sense. So uh, the United States has what's known as a navigation servitude. If the United States government acts to preserve navigation in navigable waters, which the ocean is, uh, it wins. <laughs> and it doesn't have to pay anybody for anything. It's a defense to takings arguments, so takings of private property. So we destroyed something that belongs to you, we did it in native navigation, you don't get any money for it. You shouldn't have been doing whatever you were doing in the first place. All right, so preserve that. Next. More importantly, it preserved its regulatory authority for commerce, navigation, national defense, and international affairs. So uh, the, the <coughs> Congress can continue to regulate in state waters for any of those purposes, and commerce is really broad. That's the Interstate Commerce Clause, 
So it's things like shipping lanes, uh, ports, uh, fisheries can come under federal regulation, uh, pollution is deemed commerce, so all of that is still subject to federal regulation, even if it's occurring in the state's offshore waters. Next. Uh, then the Congress put in this weird catch-all, nobody knows quite what it means, but any other federal rights that are paramount to the states. Commerce is what they rely on. All right, next. Uh, plus, the United States reserved back all the lands that are associated with federal property. So, federal ports, federal military bases, any tribe that has a coastal reservation that extends out into the waters, that's more common in Washington. Uh, all that's still federal. Next. So, um, California has a distinction of being the first state to work with the federal government to nail down where that three mile line was, or is. Uh, and the benefit of doing that to California is it won't move. Once it's nailed down with the federal government and approved by Congress, uh, and it's, oh, sorry, it's approved by the Supreme Court, it won't move no matter what's going on in the future with climate change and sea level rise and oceans moving. Uh, took a long time, <laughs> took eight years to get it nailed down as to where everybody was happy with it. Uh, but the Supreme Court did affirm it, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, as of last week, California remains the only coastal state that's managed to get through this whole process. So, a couple other states are trying. But that three miles is now nailed down. All right, next. So why does it matter? Uh, this was in the context of the Huntington oil spill that occurred in 2021. Uh, and where those lines are matters as to who gets jurisdiction over the oil spill. So I'll show you a blow in a second. This is the shipping lanes. Shipping lanes are set by international standards. Uh, the International Maritime Organization sets the major shipping lines for the world. Why? Because we want all those big tanker ships to be going the same places. All right, we don't want them making up their routes as they go. So that's that, but that's the shipping lanes for the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, and a few other places, obviously this. So the red line is the Submerged Lands Act line. That's three miles out. Okay, that's California waters. Uh, the green line, I'll show you a blow up in a second, is what's called the HG line. And uh, it's HG line from the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Any oil platform between the red line and the green line has to pay higher royalties to the state of California than if they're farther out to sea of the green line. Um, to that. Next. So, um, when, so you see this is the Submerged Lands Act boundary right there. Uh, you can see where the pipeline goes in purple. There's that 8G eight, eight line in green. And this was a way of figuring out who had jurisdiction over what parts of that was. Next. All right, so all that leads us to the Army Corps of Engineers, which is one of the major agencies that exercises those Federal Reserve powers under the Submerged Lands Act. And it does so through, for coastal purposes, primarily two statutes, which are, all right, next. Uh, the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, uh, which authorizes the Army Corps to protect navigation in the navigable waters, uh, which includes the coastal zone. Next. And the second one, which is the one experiencing some conniptions right now, is the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, better known as the Clean Water Act, uh, which authorizes the Army Corps to regulate dredging and filling of the navigable waters subject to oversight from the Environmental Protection Agency. Next. All right, so this is the Corps of Engineers' only own picture of its regulatory jurisdiction. Uh, what's important about it is historically, Section 10 is the Rivers and Harbors Act jurisdiction. Section 404 is the Clean Water Act jurisdiction. So historically, uh, the Corps very much viewed its Section 404 Clean Water Act jurisdiction to be broader than its Rivers and Harbors Act jurisdiction. I'll get to why that might be in trouble on the freshwater side, probably not as in trouble on the saltwater side.
Uh, the other one, the other statue that I didn't mention is the Ocean Dumping Act. So if you want to take anything out to sea and dump it, you're also talking to the Army Corps of Engineers, but that's usually way out to sea. So, next. All right, so, uh, next. Next. There we go. All right. So, Section 9 of the Rivers and Harbors Act uh, says that uh, it shall be uh, not lawful, okay, it was 1899 when Congress wrote this, it's a little convoluted in language, but it shall be not lawful to construct or commence the construction of any bridge, dam, dike, or causeway in, over or in any port, roadstead, haven, harbor, or canal, navigable river, or other navigable water of the United States until the consent of Congress to the building of such structure has been obtained and plans for such structure have been approved by the Army Corps. So you want to put something big in the navigable waters, in or, in or over the navigable waters, including harbors and the ocean, you got to get Congress's approval and then submit the plans to the Army Corps of Engineers. All right, the exception to that is that states can authorize certain of these structures uh, so long as it's, uh, the waterway is entirely within the, that state and again, provided that the Army Corps approves the plans and that you build according to the approved plans. All right, once the plans are approved, no deviations or modifications are allowed without going back to the Army Corps. Point being, you want to build along the coast, you're talking to the Army Corps of Engineers. You might also be talking to Congress. Okay. Next. The other big section of the Rivers and Harbors Act next is section 10, which is what you actually run into more often. Uh, the creation of any obstruction in the navigable waters is not allowed without Congress's permission. So you want to put in something big that actually blocks the navigable rivers, or navigable waters, it works better with rivers, so you want to put in a dam you're talking to Congress. Um, otherwise, it shall not be lawful to build or commence the building of any wharf, pier, dolphin boom, weir, breakwater, bulkhead, jetty, or other structures in any port, roadstead, haven, harbor, canal, navigable river, other water of the United States, outside established harbor lines, or where no harbor lines have been set yet, except talk to the Army Corps. So anything else you want to build that doesn't actually block the navigable waters, talk to the Army Corps, you need a, a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and it shall not be lawful to excavate or fill, and you can alter or modify the course, location, condition, capacity of any port, roadstead, haven, harbor, canal, lake, harbor, refuge, or enclosures within the limits of any breakwater, of any channel of the navigable water, unless you have a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. All right, so basically you want to muck with the navigable waters of the United States, including the ocean and coast. You're talking either to Congress or more likely the Army Corps of Engineers. That's the Rivers and Harbors Act. Next. All right, the Clean Water Act, on the other hand, is a little more limited in some <coughs> respects, both geographically and in terms of the activities the Army Corps permits. Uh, next. So if you are discharging dredged or fill material into the coast or into the navigable waters, which includes the coastal zone, uh, that requires a section 404 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. Next, and as I mentioned, the US Environmental Protection Agency can veto permits it doesn't like. It doesn't do that very often. Uh, it's done it about 11 times in the history of this act. Uh, most recently up in Alaska, uh, or a mine, but uh, it can do it, and it, the threat of doing it usually makes them a little more environmentally friendly than the, the core would otherwise make them, all right? So, like, so that's the one that's been under some uh, recent conniptions, next. <laughs> and it's because the Clean Water Act turns on that navigable waters definition, so clearly, Still within the Clean Water Act's jurisdiction next are the ocean, uh, something known as the contiguous zone, which is the next zone out uh, under international law. But Clean Water Act turns on the term navigable waters. Uh, and that's what gets litigated next. That includes the territorial sea. No one's worried about that. Next. <laughs> 
but it also includes the waters of the United States. So how many of you are at least dimly aware of all the litigation going on about waters of the United States in the Supreme Court? All right. <laughs> There's been a ton because Congress didn't define this, and it has no analog, but navigable waters clearly does. So uh, since 2001, uh, next, the United States Supreme Court has been worried about the extent of the waters of the United States. Uh, the Army Corps and the EPA had in the 1980s consensus regulations on what counted as a water of the United States. Provision 3 about intrastate waters, uh, including things like wetlands and prairie potholes and uh, provision 7 about wetlands, adjacent wetlands to other waters, have been the two that have driven the U.S. Supreme Court crazy. Uh, so 2001, the Supreme Court decided 5-4, isolated water is not included within the Clean Water Act. So it's got no visible connection to anything else, not included. 2006, it fractured. And that's what uh, happened last summer. Uh, it's a result, resolution of that fracture. So 2006, case called Rapanos versus United States. Court split 414 on what is included in the definition of the water of the United States. Uh, bizarrely, uh, for legal reasons, I'm happy to explain over lunch if anyone wants to hear, really. Uh, the one, which was Justice Kennedy, won. Uh, so the one vote decision, one vote test ended up controlling in the United States. And that was a significant nexus test. So as long as you had some ecological or chemical or physical connection to a larger water body, you were in. All right. Next. This last May, the Supreme Court decided Sackett versus EPA, uh, which resolved that lingering issue about which test. Uh, involved Priest Lake in Idaho, so nothing to do with the coast, except that the Supreme Court decided, uh, again, 5 4, that the uh, significant nexus test was the wrong test. That we're going to use a continuous surface water connection test for anything itself that's not a navigable water. What does this have to do with all of you? All right, that up there is a navigable water. No one's fighting about the ocean itself. As you move inland, though, you need to have that continuous surface water connection to the ocean or a large river for anything else to trigger Army Corps of Engineers jurisdiction. And that's not necessarily going to hit or get to every wetland or small water body along the coast. All right, so the EPA and the Army Corps are in the process right now. They just issued some new regulations that immediately got challenged uh, of figuring out exactly what's covered and what's not. I'm just flagging this for you. If you're thinking about adaptation efforts that might need permits, if you've got smaller water bodies, somewhat inland, not directly connected to, again, the ocean or a large river, they may now be out of Army Corps of Engineers jurisdiction. Probably still within California state jurisdiction. So it may not matter all that much in California. Uh, places like Idaho and Iowa, it's going to matter a lot. In California, it will still be regulated no matter who you might be talking to. Questions? Like I said, I know that was a lot to hurry, but just be aware that that's changing as we speak. All right, next. So what are the consequences of the Army Corps being involved in the permitting? If you're building something, uh, if you do trigger Section 404, you've now got a federal agency involved. And that has some follow-on consequences to it. Uh, so next. First of all, the state of California has authority under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act to certify whatever the Army Corps is doing. Uh, and this has led to some battles between the state of California and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, but it has the right to certify whatever the Army Corps is doing or permitting. 
and put some additional conditions on it. Next. Uh, we already talked about the consistency determination. The Army Corps' involvement is going to trigger that Coastal Zone Management Act consistency determination. Next. The Army Corps is going to trigger the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, in California, again, this is one of those things that might not matter as much because CEQA's probably already been challenged and that's actually harder to comply with. Uh, but it does trigger NEPA. Next, it also triggers Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, Federal Endangered Species Act, if there happen to be endangered or threatened species listed under federal law in the area. Uh, the Army Corps is going to have to go through a consultation process with either the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, before issuing that permit. Next. And then there's some random other federal statutes that might get triggered if the Army Corps is involved. Uh, most often it would be the National Historic Preservation Act. If you've got tribes around, it's going to try to trigger some tribal review. Uh, but the point of all this is the minute the Army Corps is involved, the legal scope of what you are doing may have just expanded tremendously. Next. All right, the other thing to be aware of is a lot of routine activities can get a general permit. I realize it's not all that visible, uh, but it is in the manual. So uh, can trigger a general permit. So if you're doing relatively routine things that either the National Army Corps of Engineers headquarters or the local Army Corps divisions have decided that individually or collectively don't pose much of a problem, uh, there are a lot of general permits available. I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of them include structures and artificial canals, uh, maintenance of structures, uh, keep going, um, <clears throat> uh, return water from various projects, some minor discharges, some minor dredging. There are a lot of things that are covered by a general permit. Why that matters, cheaper and faster. Uh, basically, if you fit within the parameters of one of these general permits, you're deemed covered unless the Army Corps said, no, there's a problem with your project, we want to take a uh, closer look, uh, and the permit fee is less. Uh, now, these are all subject to that Section 401 certification from the State of California. Uh, what you see is that the State of California loves to impose conditions on these permits or not certify them. Uh, it does so more than most states I'm aware of. So uh, you have to check not only the nationwide permit status, but also what the state of California said about it, because they don't necessarily apply the same way in California. OK, keep going, keep going, keep going. There's a lot of nationwide permits. Uh, New ones for aquaculture just got added, so those will possibly become interesting uh, for various activities in California soon. Next. Uh, the other thing that exists are uh, regional permits. So uh, around here it would be the Los Angeles Army Corps Regional District has regional general permits. Uh, of most interest probably to uh, coastal adaptation. Uh, next is one that expired in 2019, uh, bioengineered bank stabilization activities, uh, which covered some of the green infrastructure projects. Uh, like I said, next expired in 2019, uh, but nevertheless, it was considered at some point. All right, next. All right, that's it on the Army Corps. Like I said, spend a little more time with it because it can trigger a lot of other things. But no, those are some important questions, and some of them, as uh, were mentioned by the facilitators, uh, involve what's going on with the natural environment at the same time. And that's one of the tougher issues about climate change adaptation in general, uh, and coastal adaptation in particular. Uh, humans are not the only things trying to adapt. Uh, so there are a lot of critters and ecosystems uh, trying to adapt at the same time, and there are some trade-offs with that 
uh, but also some legal implications. So next slide. Uh, and so there's actually two sides to the interaction of what's going on with the environment and what humans are doing with coastal adaptation. Uh, the first side I'm going to talk about is that coastal adaptation uh, can affect the marine environment just like coastal development in the first place can affect the marine environment because that tends to be the side that triggers legal intervention or triggers legal issues. Uh, but like so there's a second side to that too of what uh, the fact that the marine environment is changing can change what coastal adaptation needs to look like for a particular community. So uh, coastal adaptation can affect the marine environment. Uh, it's a complicated slide. It's a great paper in Nature Climate Change. Uh, but basically just looking at the fact that the choices that communities make about how they're going to adapt to climate change, uh, it's focused on the coast, but this would be true pretty much anywhere can make it easier or harder for everything else to adapt at the same time. And so one reason for being interested in nature-based solutions is they actually tend to uh, help everything else adapt at the same time as human beings. Uh, again, you know, the more you go with the infrastructure, hard infrastructure solution, the more difficult you're making for everything else to adapt simultaneously. So those choices do matter. And like I said, they do come with some legal implications as well. So next slide. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious being in doing environmental impact assessments. Uh, the United States is credited with inventing the concept of environmental impact assessment. We've since exported it to the rest of the world. Uh, and California and Congress came up with environmental impact uh, assessment legislation pretty much simultaneously. It's pretty close. So uh, there's two possibilities of why you might legally need to do an environmental impact assessment for a coastal adaptation project in California. Next. Uh, those are NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which is the federal side of it, and the California Environmental Quality Act, which is the California side of it. Uh, so next. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, uh, gets the date 1969, although it technically got signed January 2nd, 1970, so it's a, it's a close call, but uh, it gets the date 1969, and it applies any time there's a major federal action that might, might significantly affect the quality of the human environment. It's a very broad trigger. Uh, but you do need the federal part. So this is where the Army Corps' involvement might be important, uh, or if, if for some reason the EPA is involved, or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, that's what you're going to get that trigger for NEPA. Uh, next, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act of 1970 applies any time that a state or local government in California authorizes or carries out a project which can be anticipated to cause a physical change in the environment. Uh, both of them can be triggered simultaneously. You can come up with projects where both of them will be triggered simultaneously. Uh, as a rough rule of thumb, uh, the CEQA is more involved. It requires a more involved analysis and has substantive requirements in it. Uh, it also has more exemptions. So, Depending on where you are on that, it, it can be easier or, or harder. Uh, NEPA, on the other hand, is purely procedural. It was not intended to be, but that's how the courts have interpreted it. And so basically, if you dot the I's and cross the T's in NEPA, do the proper analysis, the final agency decision can be pretty much whatever the agency decides to do. It doesn't have to be the most environmentally friendly outcome. Uh, nevertheless, those procedures have teeth. If the, agents, the federal agency involved doesn't follow the procedures, it leads to litigation, and there is a ton of litigation in the federal courts. So uh, they're a little bit different uh, in both what they ask for and in the procedures involved, and like I said, in the exemptions. Next slide. So the NEPA process, don't try to read all of that, uh, but uh, there are a couple of points when the agency is making decision. So the first uh, decision is whether it has been triggered at all. Uh, there are categorical
exemptions with some agencies. Some agencies are bigger fans of exemptions than others. So the Forest Service, for example, has all sorts of categorical exemptions. Um, a lot of other agencies don't have many at all. But if a, an exemption applies, I, the agent can, agency can decide, hey, we're covered by an exemption. NEPA doesn't apply, we're done. That's a challengeable decision in court. If they don't, if there's no exemption that applies, then they have to decide whether to do the full-on environmental impact statement, or EIS, or whether to do a lesser analysis called environmental assessment to figure out whether they need to do an environmental impact uh, statement. And at the end of the environmental assessment, the agency can come to a finding of no significant impact, meaning we really don't think this is going to have an effect. It's called a FONSI. That's a challengeable decision, all right? Both statutes are acronym related, sorry about that. Uh, but if it's a, something like dredging a harbor or building a dam, something the agency knows is going to take a full-on environmental impact statement, they just go straight to that uh, and eventually come to a record of decision with a chosen alternative of what they're going to do. The heart of the environmental impact statement is a comparison of alternatives. So the agency has to at least do, we don't do anything at all, the no action alternative. We do what we want to do, and then at least one or two other alternatives to those two. But once it's gone through that analysis, compared the impacts, like I said, under NEPA, it can pretty much decide to do what it wants to do as long as it did the procedures. Lots of opportunities for public impact, uh, input into the EIS process. Uh, and public comments do often shape the final decisions made, uh, particularly if a segment of the public can bring expertise to bear on an issue that the agency wasn't aware of. So it's very, can be very effective to influence what has actually done, even though there's no real legal requirement that the agency do a more environmentally friendly alternative. Next. Oh, before we go to that, this is a major way that tribes have made their voices heard, by the way, is to use the EIS process uh, when federal agencies are doing things like pipeline, pipelines and uh, other development plans. So it's very, been very important for getting tribal environmental justice consideration in front of courts. Okay, next. All right, this is CEQA. <laughs> <coughs> Something you should notice right away is there are a lot more boxes, a lot more arrows, a lot more things going on. Uh, so yeah, like you said, it's a little bit more complicated process. Uh, it's got a couple more decision points uh, and a lot more exemptions. And figuring out whether an exemption fits or not is actually a pretty good chunk of CEQA litigation uh, where people claim exemptions. So there are actually 15 statutory exemptions uh, from CEQA. Uh, most relevant to coastal development are the emergency exemptions, so the emergency repair and replacement exemptions uh, during a disaster or declared emergency, um, and actions to mitigate an emergency while it's ongoing. So those are the, the big statutory exemptions. There are also 33 categorical exemptions, which are for smaller actions, but it can include some maintenance and repair of coastal structures. And uh, then pretty much anything you do to prevent or mitigate an emergency will get you exempted from CEQA. So that's a pretty, pretty big exemption. So a lot more exemptions in CEQA as a matter of course than from NEPA. Uh, but then, like I said, you've got this complicated decision-making process. Again, lots of opportunities for public input. If two agencies are involved, the lead agency has to be designated, uh, and they take on uh, the bulk of the action. Uh, you do get the environmental impact report, the EIR, if you do have the, the physical impact that needs to be fully evaluated. All right. And CEQA comes, like I said, with some substantive requirements. There is a duty to do, if not the, the least environmental damaging option, at least the, it's one of the better options. Um, next. 
thinking about the environment, there's a whole lot of statutes that can come in to deal with wildlife of various kinds, uh, marine creatures of various kinds, uh, and various kinds of protection. So the whole conservation array of federal and state statutes is pretty long. I'm going to hit some of the big ones. Uh, so next. Next, yeah. So there's the Federal Endangered Species Act, uh, which probably, if it gets triggered, has the most teeth of most of them. Next. There's the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act. Next. Federal Lacey Act, which uh, protects birds. Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Next, the Federal Migratory Bird uh, Conservation Act. A lot of migratory birds along the coastal pathways. Those can kick in. Next, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. Next, the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which is the federal fishery statute that does occasionally cross into state waters. Next, the California Endangered Species Act and the California Marine Life Protection Act. So there's a lot going on potentially in the coastal zone with various uh, critters. So I'm not going to go through all of these. You can heave a sigh of relief. We don't have that much time. Uh, I'm going to focus on the endangered species protections because they are the most often triggered uh, and potentially can involve the most complications. So. Next. All right, so just an image of what it is we're trying to protect while we're adapting to climate change. We want those healthy marine ecosystems to persist as long as they can. Uh, and in whatever configuration they may have to adopt at some point. Uh, but like I said, that's the flip side of human adaptation is that ecosystem trying to adapt at the same time. Next. Okay, uh, so Federal Endangered Species Act, there's actually a pretty cool NOAA database about the critical habitat of federal endangered species, so next, uh, which you can't see hardly at all. Okay, um, everything in orange is critical habitat for some federal endangered species. Uh, the one you really can't see, and this would be true even in bright light, is along most of the California coast is a very thin gray line that is for the black abalone. So that's one of the critters that's protected along the coast. Uh, what, I, what I've also got clicked here is the critical habitat for leatherback sea turtles, uh, for green sturgeon, and for humpback whales. All right, so uh, we do have federally protected species along our coast. Um, and once you're into their critical habitat, you have to start worrying about what impacts you might have. Now, I highlight the black abalone uh, because you might do something that interferes with a humpback whale. You usually have to be a little farther out to see than the coastal zone for that. Uh, but the black abalone is a potential for any coastal community that has the black abalone. Uh, all right, so what the major prohibition is in the Endangered Species Act that could affect coastal communities and the California Endangered Species Act is a lot the same, is a take prohibition. So you can't, uh, can't mess with an endangered species, basically, or threaten. You can't uh, kill it, you can't chase it, you can't harass it, you can't harm it, uh, and you can't mess with its critical habitat. Uh, so um, that take prohibition is Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act. I mentioned if you got a federal agency involved, you might also be dealing with the Section 7 consultation. Uh, coastal communities in and of themselves would trigger that. Uh, if you're in a Section 9 and you think you might be doing something that might take an, a federally listed endangered species, uh, like I said, to a large extent, California is the same idea. You want to get what's known as an incidental take permit. This ins uh, insulates the community from liability under Section 9, uh, but the incidental is important. You can't be doing something with the intention of taking endangered species, which hopefully you weren't doing anyway. But, uh, so you have the incidental take permit, and that comes with a habitat conservation plan. So that's the major work in getting the incidental take permit, is to put together that habitat conservation plan. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You can do what you want to do to adapt as long as you have a plan for conserving 
the habitat, improving the habitat, extending the habitat of the species you might affect. All right. Um, there are also permits available. Uh, they're easy to get, easier to get than the incidental take permit. Uh, they're also more limited in the circumstances where they apply. But you can get permits for scientific research uh, as an exemption from Section 9. And you can get permits for educational purposes as an exemption from Section 9. In the right circumstances, those might be relevant, uh, particularly if you are study, studying potential coastal adaptation measures. Next. <coughs> Whoa, back up, sorry. And this is just an example which you can't read at all, sorry. Uh, but it basically says, don't go here. We've got endangered birds who are nesting in this area. Uh, this is a part of the coast that has to be protected for the endangered birds. Uh, like I said, it's a little more readable when I was looking at it at all. All right, next. <laughs> All right, uh, the California uh, Marine, uh, State Light Marine Protection Act, we have a uh, state marine protected area, sorry, Sea Light Protection Act. Uh, we've got now the whole array of marine protected areas up and down the California coast. Uh, there are different flavors of these marine protected areas. They're all for biodiversity purposes. Uh, but the exact legal requirements for each kind are slightly different. Uh, and so, you need, if you have one of these nearby, you need to know what the restrictions are, how close to shore it is, what it is it's protecting, and what you might be doing that might trigger one of those restrictions. Next. All right, I uh, also can't see this really well. We, at the national level, have uh, four and about probably to have five uh, national marine sanctuaries off of our coast. Uh, mostly these are in the north, so, so the great, Greater Farallon Islands National Marine Sanctuary, Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and then down here the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, those come with some restrictions of their own. Uh, what will be interesting in this area over the next few years is the proposed Chumash uh, Heritage National Marine Sanctuary going in off of this coast. Uh, the initial proposal is pretty big. It's everything between just uh, north of Channel Islands out, so uh, it would be pretty big. Uh, it's a cultural heritage national marine sanctuary as opposed to a biodiversity national marine sanctuary. Uh, but the cultural heritage is the Chumash, so there's a lot of biodiversity protection in that. So uh, what exactly that will look like is still being decided if it gets through at all, but it looks like it's going to. So you might want to keep that one on your radar for whatever requirements go in. Now, National Marine Sanctuaries, despite the name, uh, each sanctuary has a different set of requirements of what's allowed and what's not. So uh, some of them allow, for example, oil rigs, the ones in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, oil rigs are allowed in them. Uh, some of them are more protective. So Monterey Bay, for example, is one of the more protective ones. There's a lot of things, sanctuary resources you can't muck with in Monterey Bay. Again, a little farther out, you might not run into them, but be aware that they're there and that they do come with requirements. Okay, next. All right, so that's on the protection side. Like I said, the variety of things that might get triggered if you're uh, doing something for a human adaptation that might uh, interfere with a protected area or protected species. Uh, but the other side of it is that as the marine environment is itself adapting, that can create issues for communities uh, that require adaptation as well. And the most common example of that across the United States little more decisively for now on the East Coast, but that will be changing, is fisheries. Uh, so next. All right, so well documented, the marine species are moving uh, mostly toward the poles. Uh, this includes commercially valuable fisheries, uh, and they are moving out of their regulatory ranges. Uh, now, West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, and the Pacific National Marine Fisheries Council. 
tend to get along relatively well. If you don't believe that, go spend some time on the East Coast where they don't get along at all. Uh, but they get along relatively well, so there is some cooperative management across boundaries on the West Coast. Uh, on the East Coast, there's a lot of fisheries that are already shifting regulatory jurisdictions. And that's causing some real problems for fishers who have permits to fish a fishery that's now two states up the coast. So um, that is becoming an issue. There's also fisheries uh, in Maine, the lobster fishery is shifting into Canada, so it's no longer even a U.S. fishery. Uh, West Coast is losing a couple of things to Canada, but Alaska is gaining a couple of things from Canada. So all of this is a regulatory shift uh, from fisheries management, but it's also a community adaptation issue. For communities that are dependent on these fisheries, uh, dealing with the fact that the fishery is no longer there or it costs you twice as much in gas and money to get to the fish you can actually catch is becoming an adaptation issue that those communities have to take into account as they're doing their adaptation planning. Not uh, a lot of legal hooks on that except the fisheries permits, but it is a real cultural issue for many communities and it influences decisions they're making about retreat, about moving, about shifting to different industries. Uh, a lot of New England communities, for example, are shifting to kelp aquaculture as a way to keep the community get together. Uh, but that's, like I said, just another facet of adaptation decisions communities need to factor in as part of the fact that the ecosystems are moving as well. Next. A little closer to home, uh, <clears throat> there's also some destruction of ecosystems going on, California forests being the most obvious in California. Uh, a lot of this is driven by the fact that ocean waters are much warmer than they used to be. If you were watching the Gulf this summer, if you are watching the Pacific this summer, it was getting a little scary. Uh, and so those ecosystems that might be important for tourism revenue, might be important for other local industry, revenue are changing as well, and that's part of the adaptation conversation uh, that should be going on, even though it's not necessarily got a strong legal driver to it. Next. But sometimes it does have a strong legal driver to it that prompts some uh, immediate action. So uh, anyone remember the 2015 closings of the Dungeness Crab Fisheries? Yeah. it's a. Uh, uh, they, they, the, hot, the warm water, they uh, start producing demoic acid, you can't eat them. Uh, and so the Dungeness crab fishery in Northern California and Oregon shut down. Uh, a lot of fishers have not returned, uh, the crab fishers. They couldn't switch, they couldn't survive the seasons that it was closed, and it moved on. So again, sometimes it does have a legal impetus to it of you can't do this anymore, no matter how much you're willing to pay to do it. So like I said, I just they wanted to flag that flip side of the adaptation issue because even, uh, communities do have to think about what their adaptation decisions are doing in the marine environment, but a changing marine environment can also shape what adaptation decisions communities want to be making and what it, it can make different options seem more viable than others. As part of that, I will flag the fact that there are now uh, multiple, what are called serious games for coastal adaptation available online. Uh, my personal favorite was developed in New Zealand. Uh, <clears throat> but these are scenario-based gaming, basically, where communities can sit down, figure out what their values are, and then run futures and just see what happens if we do this, what happens if we do, or what potentially happens if we do this, what happens if we do that. Uh, it's a great way to get all of these multiple pieces into one pot potential future uh, and see what decisions feel better than other decisions. So I will end with that as just a recommendation. Uh, it's gotten a lot of good play in New Zealand and Australia and a few places in Scotland. Uh, but it's a great way to start trying to get all those multiple pieces, like I said, playing out at once to figure out what communities want to do. And so I just wanted to highlight one particular initiative in the category of cutting green tape. In other words, for these restoration projects that aren't big capital projects with huge construction, things like that, 
there's a lot, there's increasing support, especially from the state, um, particularly for CEQA exemptions to uh, streamline those projects. Um, I'll say that the permitting landscape is still challenging. I know for this restoration project at Dockweiler, I'm not sure where it is, uh, but our project partners on, on that particular project have, um, have said that they needed eight permits for that project, which, which is essentially seeding and, and watering and putting interpretive signage. So this is just one piece of that big uh, puzzle, and I'm certainly not the expert, but it's something that some of our partners are considering increasingly, especially for nature-based solutions, for living shorelines, and so um, I wanted to make sure that this is on everybody's radar. So um, this program is through CDFW, a part of the Cutting the Great Tape program, um, which was signed in late 2021. And it provides a statutory exemption for a restoration project, something that Robin kind of alluded to. Um, and it's in effect until early 2025. Um, and CDFW would be the agency that coordinates with other agencies on this. So the requirements around this uh, exemption include that a project must result in long-term benefits to climate resiliency, biodiversity, and sensitive species recovery. So it needs to be um, considering climate change and resilience in addition to these kind of habitat restoration elements. And it needs to include procedures and ongoing uh, management, so kind of adaptive management for protection of the environment. Um, this kind of multi-benefit project is really key to qualifying for this exemption because they explicitly state that these projects cannot exclusively conserve, restore, protect um, fish and wildlife and their habitat. So when we're thinking about some of the especially green adaptations in California and Southern California that we're thinking about, um, some of them could be really good fits for this. And we'll see just a few projects that have qualified that might give a sense of, of um, where our projects of interest might align. Okay. So these are a few projects um, that have qualified for the exemption. We have the Santa Ana River Riparian Restoration, that's very local. We have a Diversion Dam removing, Removal and Stream Restoration Project. So this one's really notable because even big, um, big kind of construction type tasks, like those associated with dam removal, can still qualify for these exemptions, as long as it addresses those multi-benefits that have been outlined. Um, and then we have um, a few coastal habitat restoration projects, Big Canyon and Ormond Beach um, in particular. Um, and you'll note that, for example, the Big Canyon project even outlines the, you know, really explicitly that they're looking at resilience in that work. Next slide. Oops, sorry. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about like I mentioned that some green or, or hybrid strategies might be um, eligible for this exemption. In particular, I know that some of the existing beach restoration footprints or kind of protected habitats um, are looking at expanding. So these could be really good um, projects, or this could be a really great exemption for these projects to begin looking into as they start to scope that um, next phase of these projects um, going forward. Uh, and then some of our other coastal habitats, for example, um, Southern California is really limited in their wetlands, uh, but for that reason, um, they might not make an especially great candidate for these projects. That's all that I had on that, and I just wanted to make sure that it's on folks' radar. So I'm